Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. So, hey, Debbie, thanks for joining me. This is Debbie Compton from The Purple Vine, and I am Jennifer Fink of the Fading Memories podcast. And I decided to try something a little different. Different is good. Learning new things is good for brain health. So I think I, I stimulated a few brain cells today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, whew, goodness, great. It's Friday. Wow. <laughs> Take a breath. It's okay. We made yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. And, so, and thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, thank you for uh, putting up with the, uh, the, you know, change of pace. Let's try something new that I have never done before. <laughs> hey, it's it's all good. I've never done a LinkedIn live before either, so I was I was no help to you. But you know what? We just jump off the cliff and learn how to fly on the way down. It's exactly. Okay. Fortunately, <laughs> we're not going splat today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So you, tell us about yourself, because I guess I'm, I'm going to have you introduce yourself to my people, and I'll introduce myself to your people, and then we'll go from there. Okay, that sounds good. Well, I am Debbie Compton. I'm the author of nine books. I'm a three-time primary caregiver, cared for my dad, who had Parkinson's until he passed in his home, and my mother-in-law, who had Alzheimer's disease until she passed in our home. And I'm still a caregiver for my mom who has vascular dementia, 21 years and going oh strong. And uh, I'm a community educator for the Alzheimer's Association. I'm also a certified caregiving consultant and advocate. So I, I am here for all things caregiver. I am here to support caregivers in whatever way that they need because I do not want them to struggle like I did. Well, that's kind of where I started. My mom had Alzheimer's disease for 20 years. My dad passed away in March of 2017, and he did 99% of the caregiving. He refused help from my sister and I, which was not smart. Um, with his chronic illnesses and caring for mom, I, I think it just wore him 100% out because he needed to go back on dialysis. He didn't want to do that. Long story short, I ended up being pre my mom primarily responsible for my mom. And I would go and visit and she would say, so what have you been up to lately? And so I would tell her and I was smart enough. I'd had enough experience with her and and in my research that I knew not to just blurt out like my entire to do list or my entire calendar because nobody mm -hmm. really wants to hear that anyway. And she wouldn't have. Overwhelmed. With it. Yeah. So I would give it I would give my answer in little snippets so it'd be like this is this was obviously this was in 2017 the before times and mm -hmm. so i was oh it's monday i went to the gym and i did spin oh okay that sounds good so what have you been up to lately so we went around and around and around like this until yes. i ran out of answers and one of the things that i have kind of clued in on discovered not sure what the right term is is that people caring for a parent have a really difficult time with the therapeutic fiblets, which I did and didn't. Um, I knew my my maternal grandmother also had vascular dementia. And sometimes she would remember that she hadn't seen her husband, my grandfather, for you know quite a while. And she would burst into tears and think he'd left her for another woman, which is really distressing because a thousand oh. percent would not have been him. And of course, right. she was distressed thinking. So I knew because my aunt had to learn the hard way because she'd be like, no, mommy died, which was not a better oh, answer. That doesn't yeah. help. <laughs> no, no. She had tears for a different reason. So I, yes. I understood that there were certain things that was kinder to not try to remind them of reality. But yes. with my mom, it was like, you know, it's like, what am I doing? It's like crazy. So I literally after about 20 minutes of being with her, I literally wanted to slam my head into the uh, the stucco walls outside because we'd sit in the courtyard of the memory care home she lived in. And I thought there's got to be a better way. And so I was trying to read books. I am a reader. Um, you know, I enjoy reading, but Alzheimer's books, a little tough. Can only read yeah. so much before you're like overwhelmed and kind mm -hmm. of getting emotional feelings churning up. 
And I was doing deep internet research and I tried all the things. So I did the music, the, you know, take an old photo album and talk about the old days. So I brought a, a scrapbook my sister had made pictures of her and I when we were children. Now, my sister looks more like you, dark hair, dark eyes, olive skin, obviously, because we're doing this live and we're not just a podcast today. People can actually see me. <laughs> I, actually got, <laughs> I actually got dressed up. I'm wearing a dress. In the Ooh, my office, you. in my home. I know. I'm like, I'm sick of all my clothes and I like this dress. So I'm just going to put it on. <laughs> it's very cute. You look Thank nice. You. Yeah. My <laughs> husband was, he was a little shocked. It feels silly to wander around the house in a, in a nice dress with no place to go, but whatever. I'm here. This is cool. Yeah, you know, I go to the mailbox in a really cute shirt and blue jean shorts. Because... <laughs> Can't see what I'm wearing down here, just up here. Yeah, now I go to our mailbox with two golden retrievers. I don't think it matters what I'm wearing. <laughs> Nobody pay any attention to me. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm trying to go through the scrapbook with her, and she does not recognize any of the people in the picture. She doesn't recognize her, her younger self. She doesn't recognize my sister and I. Mm-hmm. It was really depressing. It's hard. And so I'm thinking all of this advice, you know, all of this, do these things and you'll have these great visits and you'll resurrect old memories that she remembers that maybe I don't remember. None of that worked. And so I was (laughs) back to the old days. I was driving to the gym and I'm like, I need to find a podcast on caregiving because there's podcasts on everything else, including non-funeral homes. So there's got to be podcasts on caregiving. So this was in 2017 mid to late 2017 and there was one and I'm like okay great you know there's one yeah I like choices but one is better than zero well unfortunately for me it just it didn't speak to what I was looking for it wasn't my cup of tea and having been an avid podcast listener for since the beginning since you actually had to listen to podcasts through your your um internet browser here we go that thing the thing that we're kind of on now <laughs> Okay. (laughs) Um, And being a photographer, so I had my poor computer streaming a podcast and running Photoshop. And if it had fingers, it would have been flipping them at me because that was a lot of processing power. So Uh I kind of fell out of love with podcasts because they were a pain in the rump until podcast players came out. So I thought, well, I can't be the only caregiver who doesn't relate to this person's podcast. And they've been around a long time. And doesn't have the time, you know, if, if you got your loved one at home, like you do, you don't have time to like do internet research and, and read books and then fail at everything that's suggested. So for better or worse, I decided I will start my own podcast. So that is my story in a that's awesome. <laughs> that, is, that is awesome. That's so cool. And that's, that's kind of like mine. So you didn't actually plan to be a caregiver. You just... Nope here we are you because the need is there right and and that was the same with me i was traveling in business going coast to coast loving life it had a great team and i was on the east coast when my dad accidentally dad with low blood pressure accidentally took my mother's pills with high blood pressure so he was nearly comatose and in the hospital and i was on the other coast when my mom passed out at the daily living center and had to be rushed to the hospital not fun And then the third time I was in Denver when my mother-in-law, who we knew was having some issues, but we really didn't know what was going on or anything and didn't know it was quite that bad because she didn't live in our same town. She was, you know, like an hour and a half from us, but she locked herself out of the house in the middle of a snowstorm and did not have the mental clarity to walk next door to the neighbor's house. But instead, she got in her car and sat in her car for eight hours until her daughter got home from work. So that's when we knew things have to change. This is just, I mean, there's a lot of issues going on here. Everybody's getting worse and we have to do something. So, um, you know, I just went to the closet and pulled out my superhero cape and uh, (laughs) superhero caregiver. Yeah, I wish, right? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I was not a superhero by any stretch of the imagination. I had no clue what I was doing. It was the same as you. I'd never even been around anyone who had Parkinson's before my dad. And so I had no idea what to do when all of a sudden he's telling me that the aliens are digging a tunnel and coming up into the house. 
<laughs> and it, it's just like, oh my gosh, okay. And so I did tons of research and you can find a lot about what's going on in the brain and what's happening to cause the delusions. Quite honestly, I couldn't care less what was going on in the brain. I wanted to know, how do I deal with this? What do I do? And what I could find was, don't argue. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's not good enough, you know? <laughs> So, uh, having done a lot more research and studying since then, then I, now I know lots of different things that you can do. And so that's why I try to get the information out there, but it was the same with my mother-in-law who we moved to room with us the last year of her life. And I finally had hospice coming in at the end to help out. And they saw some of the things that I had created, my husband and I created to make life safer. And they were like, where did you read about this? And I was, read about it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we just created this because it's called survival, you know, <laughs> because the traditional bed alert systems did not work for us. And so we had to come up with something that would and keeping her in the house, the traditional things did not work. So when they don't work, you create something new. But that little hospice nurse is the one who really changed my direction because she said, other caregivers need to know about this. This would really help other people because they don't know about this. And I mean, really, before that, I had never even considered it because I was just trying to keep my head above water. I'm, you know, juggling, trying to take care of these poor little sweethearts that are having so many mental problems and stuff. And I didn't have time to think about anyone else until she said that. And I didn't have time to act on it at that time. I prayed about it. And um, so then after my mother-in-law passed, then that's when I wrote my first book, The Caregiving, How to Hold On While Letting Go, because I share in it a bunch of the different tips and ideas, practical information that caregivers can use in their daily walk and in their daily life and the things that they run into that you don't just need a plan A or a plan A and B. It's really nice if you can have an A, B, C, and D. Yeah, for real. Right. Right. Because like you were saying, I mean, this stuff wasn't working. So then what do you do? You know, if they only give you one option, you don't know. And you're stuck trying to create things. So my whole mission is empowering caregivers with the tools they need to live a safer and happier life. Which is important. I see a lot of caregivers, especially those that are caring for a parent. They're still trying to work. Because when my dad passed away, I was 50. My, the dog oh. had died. My daughter had finally moved out at 25. You know, then my yeah. dad died. We had to put my mom in memory care. That was the first three and a half, two and a half, three and a half months. It was March. He died March 2nd. We moved her to memory care March 16th. So whatever, that's two and a half months. Yeah. It was a, mm. We went through a lot at the beginning of 2017. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I've had some recent conversations that I'm, I'm going to start bringing up this idea to people because one of the biggest problems is there is no help. If you don't have the money to pay for memory care or, you know, the, the, all the day, the social program, day social programs, I think is the right word term to use. Daily living trouble. centers. Yeah. You're in trouble. And then of course, you know, we've had two plus years of like places are closed, places are open, they're closed again. And, and all of that confusion with, you know, how do we protect seniors from, you know, getting COVID, but also not isolating them. There's a whole mountain of research they've got there. Mm -hmm. But I think when somebody is diagnosed with any, any reason that causes a dementia, you should immediately be put into the palliative care program. And of course, mm -hmm. everybody's first instinct is, well, there's no money for that. Well, yeah, that's true. But I think, and math's not my strong suit, but I'm good with dollars and cents, is mm. the money that would be saved from people having to retire early and have less Social Security and all of the economic factors that are involved and not having to rush to doctors for all kinds of things and not having all these trips to the hospital for various, holy cow, what the heck's going on kind of situations. I mm -hmm. think that savings could then be transferred to palliative care. And now you've got somebody, you know, you've got a team that's taking care of you who is taking care of somebody else. I'm like, I've had mm -hmm. enough conversations over the past four plus years that 
finally that idea popped into my head and hoping we can yep. make it a thing because yep. it, would be it would be wonderful because, you know, you're in the doctor's office and you get that diagnosis and you're in shock and then they just send you out the door, which I understand they have a lot of patients to see and all that. But I mean, you don't know what to do. You're just really just in shock of, OK, and you're trying to sort out now, what do we do? What steps do we need to take? What needs to happen? The good news is um, there are more and more resources out there available now. And that's going to be critically important because as the baby boomers age, there's going to be more and more people with different dementias. I mean, the number one risk factor for getting Alzheimer's is age mm -hmm. and we're living longer. So it's going to grow exponentially. A lot of people, fortunately, see that and are developing companies and creating companies to address that need in advance. And that's a that's a wonderful thing. I've talked to a lot of people who are creating uh, singles, even senior single communities. So where you just go and will live together and help support each other and share the doctor and the nurses and that sort of thing. So, I mean, that's awesome. And anything we can do. And I try to I mean, I would love if doctors would just say, hey, call her, you know, she'll help you and talk to people and prepare them for what's coming next. And and uh, just so they can have a little bit of advanced knowledge. I had no idea what was coming. And I had no idea how bad it could get, which maybe you don't want to know that. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> just one step at a time. Just learn the one step. That's that's the way to do it that's easier, you know, instead of just getting all at once. But it's important. Getting all at once could be overwhelming, but then on the flip side of the coin, you know, people don't realize, because I've had a lot of conversations with people who are like, your mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. And my mom probably had younger onset Alzheimer's because it, the signs were all there, but she wasn't, mm -hmm. she resisted a diagnosis until she was 69. And by the time yeah. she was diagnosed, it was definitely mid stages. So it, it doesn't exactly take a medical degree to like back up, you know, four right. years and say, yeah, pretty sure she had younger onset Alzheimer's, which is generally aggressive. And mm -hmm. I guess it wasn't with her. So I don't know. I, I, I just know yeah. enough. to. <laughs> it wasn't with my mom either. And, and that's yeah. why I tell people because they'll say, well, what's the life expectancy? Mm -hmm. Well, what was your life expectancy before they got dementia? You know, it's you don't know. My dad was seven years from the time of diagnosis till he passed. My mom, 21 years. And and like you, if we look back on it, she had problems a long time before that. But we just kind of we were in denial. And and sadly, I mean, at the beginning, I was like, Mom, if you just focus, just pay attention. You'll remember this. Pay attention to me because that's what dad would tell me. She just doesn't listen. That's all it is. She just doesn't listen. And it, OK, seemed plausible, you know, but but looking back, I'm like, no, she had early onset. <laughs> and we had a business <laughs> together and my mom started. You know, it was infrequent enough, and she was like 52 and a half. So I'm 55. So thankfully, I survived the 52 and 53 years. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the pandemic started when I was 53. So that wasn't fun either. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> yeah, I was like, there are days I look back on on the on the recent past. I'm like, we've been through a lot in my household in five years. So yes. I'm done. Like, okay, I just I just want like. I don't know. I just mm -hmm. I want the something. I'm not sure what I That's want. Smooth more. sailing for a while. <laughs> yeah, just you know, it does it doesn't have to be perfect, but like, yeah, could we just dial back things and uh, just crazy? But mm -hmm. you know, so she would start taking orders from clients with no due dates, no instructions, no any way of getting stuff done, and the client would show up the next day, and you'd be like, oh, <laughs> sorry, Hi. It's not done. <laughs> And, and of course it happened to like the same client, like three times. And it's like, she'd, she'd like step in the doorway and I'd be like, and she's like, again, I'm like, I'm sorry. And my mom always did it on Tuesdays and Wednesdays was her day off, but it was really easy to dismiss because, you know, it's a business. Maybe you need to use the restroom. Maybe the phone rang, maybe the phone rang and somebody came in the door. Maybe, you know, like stuff happens, sure. Yeah, but it, it wasn't, we'll justify it. It, it, it started happening more often I had a really good client. We, we had a photography studio and one hour photo lab. And I had a client, really good client, call me up. My mom was working on their portrait order. 
And this gal who was, is still, but at the, for me at the time, you know, a very successful real estate agent in our town, I pick up the phone and it was like F bomb <clears throat> city. And I was like, Whoa, first off, didn't know she talked like that. Secondly, what is going on that caused her to just, you know, like, mm-hmm. ooh. so basically she was giving my mom instructions. She um, had adult braces. She wanted them removed. That is not an easy thing to do in Photoshop. Apparently my mom's brain went, that's hard. We're not doing that because it just kept <laughs> not happening. And I guess there was other things. I finally got her calmed down and, and I said, okay, so tell, you know, what is it that you've been telling my mom? Cause obviously somebody else needs to know what's going on because I'm not sure mm-hmm. what's going on with her. I'm, I, I suspected, but I didn't want, I didn't want to tell other people. This was in the early two thousands, you mm-hmm. know, probably like, uh, well, let's see, we moved to that location in 96. So it was between 96 and 2005 because they retired in 2005. So I, you know, I got I, at that point, started like supervising. If I heard my mom shooting the breeze with client, I'd like go up and say, oh, so what are we doing for Debbie today? And make sure no. somebody else had a clue. Yes. Yeah. And one day I, I always showed up first, even though my parents literally were nine tenths of a mile away. I was 20. I would show up first, get all the equipment running, get the whole place up and running for the day. I'm going through the orders that the that she had taken or somebody had taken. And it's funny how like your brain works because we had employees and they would bust through, get stuff printed and they'd put them in the work envelopes and then they wouldn't like punch the wallets apart or cut the five by sevens apart and then bag them and put them in the pickup drawer, right? They would just get all the work done. And I think they were doing it. They were trying to get everything done so she could do the easy part. Like, I don't know why it took me this long to realize that was probably what was going on. They probably knew something was going on with her. Mm -hmm. But one day I got in there and there was an order. Again, zero information, like literally just photographs stuffed in a work envelope. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? Because I was frustrated. And she Mm -hmm. looked at me and goes, I don't know. That's one of the employee's handwritings. And I'm like, "Uh, no, it's not. Was it hers? It was hers and her and the employee. I mean, we're talking like if one per the employee was very loopy. And my mm-hmm. mom's was very angular. You could dash by, you know, somebody holding up each person's handwriting. You could literally run by and go A, B, and B right 100% of the time. It was that different. And I was like, oh, crap. And so I told my mm-hmm. mom, I said, you know, kind of getting concerned because, you know, you used to have, you know, daffy moments a couple times a week. I said, now you're starting to have them more like a couple of times a day. And she looked at me and she goes, well, I don't want to end up like my mother turned around, stomped away from me. And I was like, well, <laughs> whoops, this is a problem because murder is illegal. Although right now, <laughs> murder would be a good option. Oh. So that is what we dealt with. And so it was like, mm-hmm. so I had to come up with all of these stealthy ninja ways of coping with her denial, which. Ugh, right. Not fun. right. <laughs> well, and that's, that's the interesting thing too. Um, having it, since I've studied the brain, now I know more from the other side of what's going on. You know, I didn't, I only knew what I was facing at the time, but, uh, with my dad, my dad knew something was wrong and it really bothered him and it stressed him out. And he, he would literally be like this because he's just the tension mm. and, and that made the d- disease progress faster. And that is why he went faster because he was so worried about it. He was stressed about it. It bothered him. My mom, to give you an example of how she is, I had her in the doctor's office. We're sitting in the waiting room, lots of people around the waiting room. This was pre COVID. And so she picks up, I hand her a magazine because she did the loop de loop a lot. That was just, it made us nuts. I know exactly when you were talking about it. I'm like, oh my, yes, (laughs) yes. So she, I handed her a magazine to distract her and she started reading it out loud. Mm. Well, the magazine, what the article she picked was warning signs of dementia. (laughs) And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how is this going to work? And she's reading it out loud to everybody, you know, that's sitting around hearing this. And I'm sitting there going, oh, I don't know what I'm going to deal with. Is she going to be crying? Is she going to be angry? I don't know what's going to happen here. You know, God help me. And so she finished through the article and she set it down on her lap. And I said, 
Well, mom, what'd you think about that? And she goes, well, thank God I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> I was it's expecting like, to hear that she thought you had it. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just like, yep, that's good. That's good, mom. Cause that's- it's just, it's important to, we don't need to add to the stress as no. caregivers. We need to relieve their stress as much as possible because their brain is working so hard. When somebody walks into the room, you look up, you know who it is. You know, generally, let's assume it's a friend or a relative. But when mom, when somebody walks into the room, she looks at them. She's trying to decide who they are, if they're friendly or not, if she knows them or not, what's their name. And then they're talking and she's trying to understand, interpret those words. What do those words mean? Are they wanting me to do something? What's happening? There's a lot going on in their brains. They just really churn and churn because if anyone has dementia, that means that there are at least two places in the brain that are dying. Not just that they're shrinking, not that they're just having trouble communicating. They're literally dying. And so focusing more doesn't help. Mm -mm. Trying to get them to memorize or learn something new is just an exercise in futility. And so we have to learn to live where they are. And if if mom says, look at those cute little monkeys in the tree. Yep, they sure are cute, aren't they? Well, let's go in the house, you know, distract. Let's distract. Distraction is, man, that's like a number one tool because of the the loop-de-loop you were referring to, like I said, mom was really bad about that. Well, I have two brothers and a sister and we all handle mom differently. And we all have different things that we do when she's in one of those modes. And so that's why I took those four different things and put them into the book because that way you've got not just my way, not just, hey, this is what I do that works for me because it might not work for you. Mm -mm. And it might work for you today, but not tomorrow. And so I give you... Here's how all four of us handle it, you know, which my my younger brother has the the funniest way, though. He buys he buys mom either an ice cream cone or a strawberry shake, which that's her favorite thing is a strawberry shake. And then when she starts talking in those loops, he's going, eat your ice cream, mom. Your ice cream's melting. Eat your ice cream. (laughs) And so mom gained some weight, but she's happy and he doesn't go crazy. So. So two out of three are good, you know, the weight. Yeah. Yeah. My mom would have gone. She loved the treats. She Mm -hmm. was a huge sugar fiend um, all her life. But the, the nagging or the reminding she would have been, she would have told me to drop dead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. She, I see people whose loved ones, you know, like on social media and stuff, whose loved ones are so compliant. And I literally, again, <laughs> want to bang my head on the wall because I'm like, and I, I've, you know, I've learned with social media, don't just judge. This is just a snapshot. We don't know right. that, you know, after they stop doing this little Instagram video of 15 seconds yeah. or a minute, or, you know, that mom didn't, you know, bitch slap her or something. Yes. But I would comment like, wow, you know, if I had done that with my mom, blah, 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 you know, um, and I would try to engage in a conversation of, you know, everybody's different. That doesn't make what right. you're doing wrong or what I did wrong. So I, I never tried to criticize or anything, but there are just right. times it's like, if my mom could have just had half of that kind of uh, compliance, it would have been really nice. <laughs> well, I, yes. And I can, I can understand that. My mom is pretty compliant. My mother-in-law, however, was not at all. She had Alzheimer's. Now, her as a person, precious, sweetest, kindest little woman you would ever want to meet. She didn't raise her voice. She didn't yell at people. She never used bad language. She was a little saint. I mean, little saint. So it was pretty hard for the family to understand when I would send a group text and say, well, your mom just cussed me out, you know? (laughs) And they're like, no, no, that didn't happen. She doesn't do that. And I'm like, well, she just threw the dishes at me. You know, she tried to throw my glass table in the floor. Uh, this is my mom was more compliant than that. <laughs> oh, she just, well, she told me she would sell me, but she couldn't get any money for me. <laughs> but the thing, the thing that caregivers need to take from that laugh, just laugh about it. It's okay. Because you know what? She loved me and I love her. That was the disease. That was not her. 
So we need to separate the two because Gene was precious and kind and sweet. Gene with Alzheimer's, that was just the Alzheimer's that was the going crazy and doing all this stuff. And, you know, because of all of that, that's what caused me to do so much more research. And that's what caused me to really be more compassionate towards other caregivers. Because if I'd only cared for my mom, who's much more compliant, I wouldn't <laughs> even know the other side of this, you know? <laughs> it's, it's interesting because beyond social media. So I've seen a gal who um, was having some struggles at work, feeling appreciated taking care of a mom with FTD, so frontal temporal dementia, frontal temporal. which mm-hmm. affects people much differently than Alzheimer's. Like, yes. You know, you become a caregiver, you start learning all this medical crap that you never wanted yes. to learn. Yes. And her mom is 100% unappreciative of everything she's doing. So she's getting double barrel shotgun of, you know, you don't matter Negative. to the world. Yeah, it's yes. tough. And the thing that she struggles with is her mother gives credit to, like, the daughter will do tasks for mom and the husband gets credit. The the daughter, yes. the son-in-law gets credit. Oh yeah. You know? And even when he corrects her says, Oh, well that was such and such person's idea. You know, that was daughter's idea. You know, the mom's just like, no. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you can't change their mind. You're never going to convince them of what the reality is because they don't live in our reality. Mm-mm. They live in their own. And my brother was the same way. My, my younger brother, would uh, he just bring mom ice cream like I was telling you about before? Well, I would take her out shopping. I'd take her out and get her hair done. We'd go to the movies. We'd do all this stuff. He would drop by and bring her ice cream. And then somebody would say, what'd you do all day? Well, thank heaven for Mitch. I didn't do anything, but he brought me ice cream. <laughs> and I'm just like, really? You know? <laughs> and we laugh about it. I tease him about it because I'm like, well, it's because you're the baby, you know? <laughs> Well, one thing that's interesting is that, and I, I don't remember which where when it's coming out, it's upcoming episode where the guest actually I can tell you because I can look over here. The guest like starts out with you know if you're taking care of a parent, they feel like you know you you're still the ten year old kid, but with yes. your your spouse, so they're it's children in laws. Sounds weird. Uh-huh. They um. They never knew them as children, so they they don't think of them as a child. So become right. It's very so, true because they get stuck in one slot. And and if you're the child, you're the child. And well, until some days, like mom told a lady that we went to high school together last week. And so I was like, huh, mom, how did that work? And she goes, I don't know. Well, that's funny. Yeah, my mom thought I was her best friend. And she that's would good. tell all kinds of people. She would tell the caregivers, you know, in the, in the memory care residence, she lived in, she said, she's my best friend. And I've known her forever. And I'd be like, you think, and they'd laugh and I'd laugh. And then my mom would laugh just because I think everybody else is laughing. Yeah. It's like, she kind of felt like she had to, but it was also funny because everybody's kind of, you know, tittering away and it was just, it was crazy. But so (laughs) my, my goal with my mom was to always give her as much quality of life, as much joy and happiness as possible and not do anything that would prolong dying from Alzheimer's because I see a lot of people who rush family members to the hospital. They rush them to the doctors and the hospitals and the doctors are like the worst place for somebody with a brain disease because they don't know there is no cure. So the doctor can't fix them. So you're basically wasting their time. It's very frustrating. I, I didn't have great experiences with my mom's primary care physician, I think because he was younger and he was, I think he just got really frustrated that he couldn't do anything. And why are you here? Please go away. I'm busy. You know, that was the impression I was always getting, but yeah, you have your, sorry, go ahead. (laughs) No, I was just going to say it is, it's very hard and it upsets them, which can then make the disease progress faster. So I cut you off. What were you saying? I was going to say, you've got your books behind you. And there was a question I was going to ask, and then we went over on a side link. And then, okay. um, so what would you, so I always tell people, you know, in the earlier stages of Alzheimer's, put a care team in place. I give recommendations on how to do that. This does not mean go out and rush, hire, rush out and hire, you know, a caregiving company because one, they're no. expensive and you might probably don't need one of those just yet. You know, Mm-mm. I tell people to, 
this is this is advice I got from another podcaster whose family should be they should be have the EGOT award of family caregiving because they did the best job I've ever had any kind of you know inf- information about. But they um, they came together as a committee. They actually even wanted to make it like a legal entity because they took care of grandma, mom, auntie, and then another. Let's see. So the podcaster's grandmother had Alzheimer's. And when his grandfather got exhausted, he reached out to his children and said, you need to find a care home for mom. So they did that. The grandkids who are younger adults raising their own children, they kind of rallied around their parents. So it was like multiple layers of support. Mom, grandma's sister, who had never married or never had children, also got Alzheimer's. So they added in more family members. And what they did was... Um, everybody said, this is what I feel like I'm good at and I can do. This is how I can help and participate. And, you know, they didn't have to necessarily all be in the same town. There was lots of ideas. Well, right. that's right. great. One, if you've got that many people, but a lot of people don't, some people don't have siblings. Some people have siblings right. that don't want to help. So my, mm-hmm. I always tell people, this is, this is my, how to put a care team in place suggestions, sit down, make a list of everything you got to do today, do that yep. all week. Now you got a week's worth of daily, you know, taking care of yourself, the house, the critters, whatever, and your person. Mm -hmm. Now add the weekly things in like mowing the lawn, getting the garbage cans to the curb, and then, you know, revise as necessary. And while you're making that list, make a list of everybody you know, and make a list of what you think their best skills are. Like, do not ask Jennifer to call and talk to insurance people or bank people or any of those processy you know policy this is how we do things people no <laughs> i will not do it i did not do it for my mom my husband who was in banking for 20 years and now is a real estate broker so you know that's all they do is deal with that kind of bs he would literally call insurance companies banks whomever until the person on the phone realized i don't have the authority to talk to this person because this person doesn't have the authority to speak on this woman's behalf so then he would then put the, speak, the phone on speaker and he'd say, okay, I have Jennifer here. This is her yep. daughter. Go ahead, honey. And I would say, this is, I, you know, Jennifer Fink, da, da, da. Right. And I'd answer all their questions. And then there's almost always this hesitation. I'm like, yes, it's okay to keep talking. I know my husband's listening. He's the one holding the phone. Trust me, it's necessary to have him here. Yes. <laughs> yes. My tolerance for dealing with those people is so pathetic that... <laughs> He just knew it's like, we're going to get stuff done. I got to step in and like be the support system because she can't even stand listening to the hold music for 30 seconds. It's really bad. So no, that's that's a good thing. And those are the steps that I advise people to do too. And not only that, how often do we run into people who say, well, let me know if I can do anything. And we say, yeah, okay. And we just dismiss it. Well, they volunteered. that That was my next, my next step. So you know, yeah. if I say, oh, my gosh, Debbie, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. Is there anything I can do to help? You're one, not your money. Yes. Hey, Jen, can you call the bank? Because I'd be like, mm, nope, sorry. Oh, look at the top. Whew, gone. But you'd be like, you know, you make those really cool muffins that have all the fruit and veggies in it and not very much sugar. Can you make me a batch of those? I want to try to see if my mom. I'll do that tomorrow. Boom. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Everyone has different strengths Mm -hmm. and that's what we have to play to. And we have to be aware of those helps that we do have around us. Because like you mentioned earlier, if you're a single or you you don't have any siblings or anything, you can still get help. You still have friends, you have neighbors, you have community. If you belong to a church, there are connections there. If you go to a senior center, there are connections there. Um, that's one thing where you can utilize the people and learn to recognize them because there are seniors that live around you more than likely that are lonely, would like to be able to visit with someone. So invite them over to just sit on the couch and watch a movie with your loved one and you can take a break. You can read a book, soak in the bath, do whatever you want. You're still there if they need help, but you also get to have a little distance and be away for a little while. And that does wonders for your, for your brain for your whole peace of mind and everything, nerves. <laughs> yeah, for real. So I have a really good story that ties into this. So one of my recent podcast guests was saying how similar kind of thing, neighbor had Alzheimer's, 
the husband was tired. You know, they're in their eighties. You know, life is tiring. And then you got to right. deal with, you know, some form of, you know, dementia causing disease. It's like, no, thanks. Mm-hmm. And this woman with Alzheimer's had been a like master gardener. The, the podcast guest was a good gardener, but could maybe stand to learn a couple things. So she asked the husband, can you bring your wife over and have her help me with my garden? And so one, he got a little break. The the woman living with Alzheimer's had, um, she had a sense of purpose. Like I'm instructing Mm -hmm. this woman, I'm helping her learn about her tomatoes or whatever it was they were doing. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the other gal, you know, maybe she got a little bit of advice. She was out there in her garden doing stuff she needed to do. It's like, it was a triple win, you know? And it's just like, that's the kind of stuff we need to understand that one, you got to talk about it. You can't hide. I mean, the neighbors are going to figure out something's going on sooner or later. So you might as well just do it sooner and put a, put a team in place sooner because, you know, I, what I like to tell people is my mom had Alzheimer's for at least 20 years and if you think you can handle that, I would like you to tell me what July 22nd, 2042 is going to look like. I'll wait while you tell me, while you polish your, <laughs> while you polish your crystal no. ball. <laughs> like, I don't right. even know what's going on next month. Like, right, right. You, know, you, can't, you can't predict it and you don't know which way it's going to turn. You don't know what's going to happen. So you have to be prepared for if you're prepared for all kinds of stuff. And that's why I put in my in my book, too, about the stages of the disease so that you can know what's coming next. And then I also suggest, you know, if you're at this stage, then you're going to want to do this ahead of time. You know, change out your glasses for plastic glasses, because there if it's Alzheimer's, there's a good chance those are going to go hurling at you. So change them out in advance. So or just get broken. And that's one more thing to deal with. Yes. One more potential injury. You know, it's like, yes. And another thing I'm sure you've talked about is in the later stages, they have more challenges eating. Mm -hmm. Um, Red plates are really good for stimulating appetites. Why I don't have red plates in my house, but they're really good for people with Alzheimer's or any (laughs) kind of dementia. Not Mm -hmm. for people like me who love to eat and don't need any kind of help. (laughs) Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Well, there's, a, there's just so many things. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to get it all condensed. And especially, you know, I try to just throw out there as much as I can. I don't know, you know, specific needs of, uh, of what the folks need at this moment. So I'm just trying to cover. I know wandering can be a big issue for people if you've got someone that's getting out of the house and all that. And uh, so there's a there's a lot of different things that you can do there. But a, a really simple one in the very beginning is just put away Coats, purses, keys, get those things put out of sight because if they see it, it triggers that go response. I need to go and and try not to argue because when they're saying, well, I guess, mom, you know, where do you want to go? Well, I want to go home. OK, if I look around, I'm like, well, mom, we are home. You know, that that doesn't help anyone. Mm-hmm. So instead, it's like, OK, well, I need to fold these towels and washcloths. Can you help me fold these? And then we'll go. Well, okay, I can help you. 
So she goes and helps me. Well, we haven't even started until she's forgotten about what it was that she wanted. So just, just don't argue if you can agree, unless it's something where someone's going to get hurt or it's illegal. Um, (laughs) Even, even then I might agree and just distract them, you know, after we do this, can I do this first? And then we will, that way they're happy and and you just get past it. And the other thing that I, I try to, that I learned and I try to pass on this knowledge is um, the quote, wanting to go home isn't necessarily a physical location. It is a feeling of um, familiarity and comfort and all of these things that even if you took them back to their childhood home and it looked like it did when they were kids, which the chances of that are slim to none, that still might not satisfy that need. And so what you suggested is also what I learned. Thankfully, my mom never pulled any of that. It was really, and she lived in her house literally like two months shy of 47 years. We Mm. moved her memory care. It was not easy. It was not fun. It took her about six weeks to get acclimated. So she didn't act like a hostage being rescued from the gulag, which (laughs) that was always atrocious. I told the story how like literally she'd wail and scream and cry when you'd come and visit and you'd be like, well, I'm here, I'm done. (laughs) Like five minutes and I'm out because it was just, it was so difficult. And then one day I showed up, she's following another resident down the hall um, for about nine months. The first nine months, my mom was there. There was always these ladies had to use the phone. I got to get to the phone. Where's the phone book? I was like, And I'm trying not to laugh because I'm like, you know, like I'm a Gen Xer and I don't use the yellow pages. So like this is just, you know, this is not necessarily a generational thing. This is just life has moved on. We don't use um the, we don't do right. the yellow pages anymore. But right. she's following this gal down the hall who was just like had to call her son. He was like, there's always this like fight defiant, you know, it was yes. never like, I could use the phone, please. No, it was always so it was, Yeah, it was just weird. They were frustrated about something. And my mom's following behind this lady and she sees me and she goes, oh, hi, follow me. I got to help my friend. And when I heard that word friend, I dang near burst into tears. It was like Ed McMahon, the California lottery and (laughs) jewelry store said, here's a bag of diamonds. You've won the jumbo lotto, which I think now is up to like some almost like a billion dollars or some insane amount of money that like. I'd like to play, but I know I won't win. So it's okay. It was just (laughs) the, the relief. And it was like, and that word friend, I mean, sometimes I tell a story, I still tear up because it was just like, Oh, it is because then she's okay. Mm -hmm. She's accepted it. She's going to be fine. And she totally forgot about her house because then it was always, I need to go back to my room. I was in the, I was, it actually isn't crazy, but I would take her. My mom's name was Diane. She befriended Diane number two, and they did befriended Diane number three. Nothing oh, wow. confusing about that. Yes, yeah, so we had Diane, other Diane, and other, other Diane. Oh, my. And the second Diane was, she was really gregarious and really fun for oh, quite a while, about mm, a year and a half. Yeah, my mom was there three years, so she was there about a year and a half. And... I would take them out. We would go get Subway sandwiches, drinks, and we'd go to the, we'd go back to my hometown where they had a splash zone in the park. I mean, there was one day we had lunch and the temperature's just going up and up and up. And I'm like, and I like it really warm. My, my mom likes it hot. And I was like, damn, I hope these ladies are going to want to go soon because I'm dying out here. <laughs> so I'm like, it's it's like okay well it's 105 no wonder i'm getting a little uncomfortable oh my goodness <laughs> and they're just oh. watching the kids and talking oh. about the kids and da, da 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 and then my mom looks around and she's like i don't think i know how to get back to my room i'm like that's my cue let's Time to go back to the air conditioned car <laughs> yes yes and people are like you take two women with alzheimer's out I'm like yeah they talk to each other it's much easier i don't have to deal with them <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it would be a great idea to take my mother-in-law with Alzheimer's, my mom with vascular dementia, to go to the doctor at the same time. Oh, because neither one of them wanted to go, though. And when I would take one, I could, I'd hear it all the way there. Where are we going? Why are we going there? I don't want to go there. I don't need to go there. Just nonstop, constant. 
So what I did was I went to my mother-in-law and I said, I need to take mom to the doctor, but she doesn't want to go. Can we act like it's your appointment? And oh, she said, smart. she said, okay. And then I went to my mom and I said, I need to take Jean to the doctor and she doesn't want to go. Can we just act like it's your appointment? Okay. Yeah. I'll help it. So they were great. It was wonderful. And they, they just, cause both of them, they were helping each other. And, and so when we got in, you know, they both saw the same doctor, so it was perfect. And, uh, you know, and the one was, one was saying, well, you don't need to talk to me. And I said, well, it's okay. We'll go ahead and talk to both of you. So it'll be fine. So they did. And they took them both around to get their blood drawn. And I took a picture of them. And then I posted it on Facebook and said, two for one at the doctor's office. <laughs> Love it. I was just, just joking. And some, somebody was like, really? <laughs> I actually took mom and other Diane to the regional park where they literally talked about this, this steep path. It wasn't an official path, but it was like a, a path that people had beat into the side of the hill. And it was next to this beautiful Oak tree. And they were talking about how, like, you know, they didn't think they could get up and down this path. And I'm like, no shit, you're not getting them. Done. <laughs> you're not, you're not. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do, I mean, it was, it was probably about this kind of degree angle. And so then they talk about, well, you know, if the kids were there, and I mean, they just went round and round and round for like 40 minutes on the freaking path. And I'm like, my yeah. there's not enough Wi-Fi out here to answer emails. Dang it. <laughs> so I just like wandered around and took pictures, you know, with my phone of the flowers and the fauna and whatever, you know, was interesting. Yeah. Time of day wasn't great for lighting, but. You know, I was, I was doing my best to entertain myself and keep an eye on the two of them. And so I was retelling this story and somebody's like, you left, you didn't leave them there. And I'm like, yeah, the uh, Rangers knew we were there. So they, <laughs> they knew what my license plate was. I have a personalized well, license plate. Wouldn't be hard to remember. So well, it was just and, like, and how great is it though? Because you got, you, they got to have a different scenery. They got to see something different. They got to enjoy life. I mean, that was wonderful. That's a, that's a perfect thing to do. Just the park is great. I, I would take them there all the time when the weather, depending on the weather, but when the weather was nice. And of course, sometimes I'd be wearing just a little sleeveless top and shorts and they're wearing, you know, sweaters and long pants and still, oh, it's cold, you know, <laughs> but that's OK. They love watching kids. And they love being around the kids. Yeah. Other Diane start got she got, went down the path of getting really paranoid and my mm. mom started separating from her and then other Diane's daughters moved her out. So my mom would hang out with other, other Diane who in the beginning, I thought she was a residence family member. I mean, hair done nice makeup. I mean, she looked better than me half the time. And mm. um, she started getting, you know, where they, they don't no notice that their hair needs combing or they put their lipstick mm -hmm. on weird or, you know, like, I don't know what's with old ladies and orange lipstick, but you know, I was like, yeah, my was mom like, has to have red. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's at least better than orange, but still. So, and she kind of, she went really quick. And so my mom was like, I'm not dealing with her anymore either, but I took my mom out as often as possible. Anywhere there were kids. We mm -hmm. went, there was one time mom. And so other, other Diane, she's like, I haven't had lunch. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's baloney. Um, mm -hmm. I really want a hamburger. I'm like, okay, let's go to McDonald's thinking, you know, they had the play zone again, pre pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately yeah. there was zero children there and the benches were really hard. So all I got oh. to hear, they, they wolfed down the burgers and then bitched about the chairs, you know, the, t the benches, they were literally flat wood. They were not comfortable. So oh. that wasn't a successful day, but we would go, there was two regional parks, one with a swimming hole. Um, there was lots of parks and California is like mm -hmm. park crazy. And, you know, I would just take my mom and she'd sit on the bench and watch the kids and I could answer emails or put my head back and just listen to the sounds of kids playing and birds chirping. And it was, it was actually worked out pretty well. And when yeah. she fell and broke her leg, March 8th, 2020, I was like, okay, not great, but, you know, now she's going to be in a wheelchair. So I'll be able to get her from point A to point B in a reasonable amount of time. And I know how to transfer somebody in and out of, mm -hmm. the, you know, the car in a wheelchair. So I was like all prepared. And then everything shut down for the pandemic. And I didn't see her for two weeks. And they called me. And thankfully, when when they released her from the hospital, I called. I 
managed to set up hospice. Thank God it wasn't any later in the month of March 2020 because it Mm -hmm. was challenging enough then. And Mm -hmm. there was extra eyeballs on mom. But yeah, breaking her leg was not um, it was the last straw for her body. They called and said, well, you know, we mom's not doing so great. We think she'd, she'd be, she'd do well with a visit from you. And I was like, Oh, thank God. So I'm terrified that mm-hmm. she's going to forget I'm her friend and right. you know, right. um, then we're going to have more problems. And right. the reason she fell and broke her leg is because she was um, not fighting with the carriers, but she was resisting them helping her. And oh. she jerked away from them and slipped and um, they don't admit she jerked away from them, but I'm like, yeah, I've known her for longer than you did. So <laughs> You can yeah. tell me that she just slipped. It did not yeah. happen that way, but I didn't blame them. It was not their fault at all. And right. I went Monday, March 30th, and I saw her and I was like, mm, nope, this is not going away. I think it's going to go. And so Aww. I just, and I was like, do I talk to her like I'm her friend or do I talk to her like I'm her daughter? And so I just said, you know, it's okay. Everybody's going to be fine. You did a great job. Mm-hmm. You know, we all look at everybody's successful and happy. And I must have talked for 20, talked and cried for 20 minutes. And she passed away the next day, which thankfully wow. was one day shy of the rent and care fees going up 25%. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. It's like I think she had a moment of clarity where she was like, let's see, I'm bed bound. I'm going to have to use this damn wheelchair thing. My rent's going up really crazy. There's this this virus thing going that i'm out check out <laughs> yep. oh. no, no late checkout for her and you know and it was it was hard to lose somebody mm-hmm. during the pandemic because sure. you didn't have any of the support mechanisms especially april 1st 2020 the rest of the world's going oh right. what the heck you go? Like, ah! you know, oh your mom died sorry but ah! it was just yeah. uh, it was 100 oh. percent different than when my dad died i'm sorry that's hard it That's was, hard. and it actually has taken longer to process because mm-hmm. sometimes stuff creeps up and there's, it's been two plus years and now stuff's creeping up and it's like, oh, okay, this is mm, interesting. Let me deal mm-hmm. with that feeling. <laughs> so, really we, well, when my, uh, when my mother-in-law passed uh, here in my house, it was, it was really peaceful. Um, she had kind of gone comatose but she would still react a little bit, you know, just a little twitch or a little, you'd see the little edge of a smile or wiggle her hand or something. And so we put all chairs in there all around the room and the whole family would gather and we told stories and we laughed and we sang songs and it was just, it was a wonderful time. It was a very peaceful time. And I think it, it it just eased her transition. And we had, we'd been doing this for a couple of days uh, because she was lingering on, you know, and, and then uh, some of them decided to go to the mall and do this and that and the other. And so they kind of, the big crowd left. And when the big crowd left, then she just went ahead and went on, was gone. She's like, Oh good. These people are gone. I can finally deal with my Yeah. Yeah. Leave me alone so I can rest. (laughs) I I talked to a gal who basically sat next to her mom for, like 24 hour, not 24 hour solid, but I guess the doorbell, right? Somebody needed her attention and she went to got, she went to answer the door or something really basic. And she went back in her mom's room. Her mom was gone. Like, it's so strange, yeah. you know? Yeah. But why don't you grab your books and show off at least a couple of those that, cause now we've been talking for about an hour. I don't know how many people hung in there this long oh, with God. us. I don't know. I hope they did. I can't, I can't see, and I don't see any comments or anything. So I'll have to go back and check the LinkedIn feed. And if people have questions or anything in there, then I'll, uh, I'll be sure and type some responses. But this is, this is the first book that I wrote. That's called caregiving, how to hold on while letting go. And that's me and my mother-in-law in in my backyard because she loved to garden. And this is an excellent book for caregivers because it tells you steps and stages of the diseases um, a lot of different ways to handle it, things that you practical information that caregivers need. And if you're thinking about calling an assisted living, it's got questions that you should ask, a nursing home, all these things, questions that I didn't even know I needed to ask when I was in the situation. So I put all that in there. And then um, this one is Sunshine for the Soul. 
And I created this. Uh, there we go. You got I'm a really crooked. Sorry. <laughs> Sunshine for the soul. And this is large print. And it's just, I did this for my mom because she loved to read and we wanted to keep her reading, to keep her connected to the words and the memory and to help the disease slow down. And so it has in there a Bible verse because Bible verses bring us comfort and peace. So it'll have a Bible verse and then it'll have a quote, an inspirational quote from Judges, Billy Graham, Dr. Seuss, anybody. <laughs> ever. There's a lot of quotes in there, but it's an inspirational quote. And then it'll have a funny story. And most of those are from our life. And a lot of those are bulletin bloopers because my dad was a country preacher. And so if you've been to a little country church, if there's a job that no one wants to do, the preacher's wife gets to do it. Hmm. So my mom became the bulletin maker in the days of typewriter, no spell check, no autocorrect, and four teenagers running around the house. So I can only imagine. I mean, you get down towards the bottom of the page and you make a mistake and then I'd be evaluating going, mm, is it really that bad? Do I really need to fix it or not? You know, and as it turns out, she didn't on a bunch of them or she just didn't catch them. I don't know. But at any rate, when my dad passed, he had had a bunch of these in his briefcase. And so I was going through his things and I found the briefcase and I was like, oh, my gosh, these are hysterical. I need to share these with people. So there's a lot of these in here. And the funny thing is my mom will read it. It's the only book she read for like a year because there's no plot. There's no characters to remember. It's just a repeating pattern of a Bible verse, a quote, a funny story over and over and over. So it'll brighten your day and make you happier. And so she reads it and she's like, you know, that lady is funny. <laughs> she doesn't even know that it's her. <laughs> and so and my, my funniest, the one that I love the best of that, she just messed up one letter in singing. She, it's, she forgot the first G. And so it says, if you enjoy sinning, join the choir. <laughs> That's so I excellent. That was, I thought that was pretty awesome. And then I was coloring with mom at the Daily Living Center, and she colored this little dog blue, and this woman started yelling at her. And I was just, oh, you know, it's like, back off my mom. But she had her own set of issues, right? And so I couldn't, I couldn't really say anything. But having the problem-solving brain that I have, it's like, okay, I'm going to figure out a way so that that doesn't happen anymore. So I created Color Me Calm, and it's mandalas. This is a mandala. You can color it any way that you want, and it's fine. There is no right or wrong. So this is full of original mandalas or designs that I created to help bring peace and calm and help you still be creative and have fun. Well, then I bought a program and I learned how to actually put words inside there. And so, <laughs> so then I created Faith Lives Here. And it has, it's an adult coloring book as well. And it has Bible verses or just inspirational quotes and things in it and um, mandalas around the outside. Because, again, there's no right or wrong. It's just you, you color what makes you happy. And the interesting thing on that is I've got a girlfriend who's going through chemo and she needed something to do to, to occupy the time. And so I sent her a couple of those and she's like, oh, man, these were perfect because it's just adult coloring is a big thing right now. So it does. There's so many benefits to it. And the relaxation, the t distracting your mind to letting you be peaceful, the whole bit. There's so many, many things. So those are the main ones. And then I've got some others, too. I did a journal, Write to Remember. And, uh, and it's a fat one. I'll um, show you real quick. Oh, that's not the right one. Hang on. Sorry. There we go. This one is right to remember. But see how thick that is? It is a fat little puppy because I wanted to give you room to write. And it also has in there, uh, it'll have some pictures and it's got just some um, journal thought starters and stuff like that. But a lot of room to journal and to write down so you can release those thoughts. And though if you're a caregiver and you've got stress, you can write it down and re it's amazing how the stress goes away. It's like it goes out through the pen and you can let go of it. And you can also write down funny things that happen so that you don't forget later so that you can look back on the good times. You can record prescriptions. You can do whatever you want. And it is undated because we don't need any more pressure. That's so true. 
you can use it as a five-year journal if you want. It just depends on how much you want to write and what you want in there. So anyway, that's, a, that's some of them. But anyway, that's and my website is uh, thepurplevine.com. I have a mailing list there where I send out weekly information and updates and stuff. There's a blog. Um, I do, I do speaking. I love that. Love talking. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) And obviously we've, uh, I've, uh, tackled the not intuitive at all or simple how to do a LinkedIn live, not anything like, uh, Instagram or YouTube, Lordy, but that's okay. But you did it. Grew grew at least one brain cell this afternoon. And this has been a lot of fun. And if anybody had to drop out early, because I think we kind of planned this for half an hour and now it's been a little bit more than an hour, which is really (laughs) typical of me. um, This video should, I, everything, the tech gods continue to smile on me. I will post it on my YouTube page and I'll put a link here on LinkedIn so you can go back and refer to it. Or if you just jumped in now and you're like, oh, dang, I missed most of it. Hopefully, pretty sure because Zoom is recording that it'll save and I'll be able to repost it. Hopefully, I didn't get to test that with the testing, so it's like actually I think that's I all did. good. Yeah, it's like life is crazy, but hey, this has been a lot of fun, and I'm sure we'll be able to do something together again in the future when I manage my calendar a little better and I'm not. Yeah. Not overwhelmed with guest requests. So that's that's okay. I would love it. I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed visiting with you and and hopefully, yeah, since it said it was recording, hopefully we've got it somewhere. So we'll <laughs> Yeah, because we'll I can also it. use the audio for the podcast also if that works out fine. So I will yes. let you go and I will see what Zoom does when we close this out. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.